described yourself previously as a natural pessimist. What are you optimistic about? My impending death. No, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I'm a, I'm a long-term optimist, short-term pessimist. I, I think that things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. But the things, you know, the, the tools and the ideas that we have, the end of the century could be just near utopia if we can get through the first half of the century. You know, because of the kinds of tools that are in development, the kinds of things that we know how to do already, the changes that we can make in terms of economies, the changes we can make in terms of uh, inequalities, there's, there's so much that we can do to make the world better. And we know how to do it. That you know, if we can get through this massive shock of the first half of the 21st century, there's a very real possibility. And I think it's in us to actually make the world a wonderful place for just about everybody. What humans can do to ourselves and to the planet and what we have the potential to do. You know, we have a, there is a very real possibility that we can, we can kill ourselves, but there's also a very real possibility that we can make the world better. That the thing is, it's just going to take some time. I'm not going to see it. You may not see it, but you know, my uh, nieces and nephews probably will. I get very you know, different you know, time scales from people. What, what three technologies are you most excited or promise find most promising today? or within the next CRISP. 15 years? CRISPR. CRISPR, I think, is going to be utterly revolutionary you know, as we start figuring out exactly what we can do and what we can't do with this ability to essentially treat genetics like a word processor. The potential there is for you know, healthcare improvements, the potential there for climate improvements. I'm really optimistic about what can be done to eliminate horrible, horrible diseases using a tool like CRISPR. Uh, I'm also optimistic, long-term optimistic about the role of automation, you know, and then setting aside any questions about singularities and self-aware machines and all that, simply the, the increasing complexity and power of automated systems to do tedious work. You know, I, I think that one of the, one of the hallmarks of the, of the near utopia at the end of the 21st century that I think is a distinct possibility will be that humans do very little work and they do a lot of arc. You, you know about Burning Man? The Burning Man Festival? Of course. And uh, if you think about it, if you've ever been, you know, the Burning Man is essentially, you know, nearly a week of people making art, taking drugs, having sex. And imagine that as the future, that we have machines to do all the work, machines to do the tedious stuff, and humans are free to make art and have fun, however they want to think about fun. And maybe it's getting immersed in a video game system. Maybe it is just, you know, having sex with all sorts of wonderful sex robots or whatever. Really, honestly, whatever. That, that, I think, is a very plausible future for 80 years from now. And <laughs> in many ways, the hardest thing about getting there will be getting over the hump of feeling like it's wrong. It's not going to be that it'll be difficult to do. It's going to be difficult to accept, for pe especially for people who grew up thinking that you know, work is how you define yourself. And you know, being sober and, and calm is the right way to live. Uh, the Protestant work ethic in the U.S. On the flip side, though, yes. there's so there, there's the argument that a lot of people have that marijuana is a much a much safer drug than alcohol, and all pretty much all studies, et cetera. But at the same yeah. time, you kind of get into the slacker syndrome of you don't ever think bigger. What happens if we do get to a society where society doesn't ever think bigger? Society doesn't ever think better, bigger. It, it, Here's, here's the dirty little secret. Most people are slackers. And whether they are slackers, but they work, or slackers, but they raise their kids, very few people in our society, and I mean that not just in the United States, but globally, very few people actually think big about the future. And I don't expect that to change. If we're, so if we're looking at the 2099, and uh, you have a lot of people who are taking, you know, doing the latest, the latest drugs and having all sorts of crazy sex and making a lot of really interesting art, and playing a lot of video games, there will still be a percentage of people who find themselves inspired to think big, not because they're going to make a lot of money at it, but because it's just fascinating. And that's what you see right now. You see a lot of people who do this kind of stuff because it's fascinating. I, mean, I don't make a lot of money, but I'm, you know, I make enough to, to get by. And I do this kind of stuff because it's really interesting, not because it's my, you know, my best, best path to uh, you know, retiring to a yacht. I don't expect that there to be any yachts in my future. We could get you a VR yacht. I'm sure we could set that up. <laughs> so. This has been another in our Fringe FM mini series where we take long form interviews and condense them down to high impact topics. 
If you'd like to get the full interview, check out the show notes or subscribe. Go to fringe.fm where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM.